you have your Bibles, we ask you to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, and uh, while you're turning there, uh, just to remind you again that next Sunday, a week from today, will be the meeting uh, we'll have over at Whitlock, and so if you can come, come, and I know Brother um, Mark Clark is coming, and we pray for him, and um, so hopefully we'll have a good number to start with. Also remember um, um, Mark Titus at their church. He's given, been given 12 months to live. Uh, but um, the Lord can still intervene. Um, God's timetable and our timetable are two different things. So uh, you remember Mark when you think to pray. Isaiah chapter 6 in the first verse. Isaiah chapter 6 in the, verse, the first verse. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. One, one, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you to be uh, in your house this morning. We thank you for that. God, we thank you for the ones that are gathered here in your name. Lord, we know by your own word that they're not here by accident, Lord, but rather by divine appointment. And we give you great glory and honor knowing that. God, we help the people that pray for help, the people that are not here, that you would draw them unto yourself. God, we pray that you would uh, bless down in West Tennessee, Lord, that uh, your voice would be heard and that souls might be saved there. Lord, it would be our hope and a privilege to see a church uh, to arise where there is none, and we pray for that. God, we pray now that you'd bless your word to the hearts of these people, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, some very familiar verses of scripture uh, and we'll notice a couple of things about it that Isaiah wanted to set a timeline the fact that Uzziah was king or had just died uh, was only to say this is the time that it happened now this week we're going to inaugurate a new president of the United States and wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if that could be the day in the year that Biden became president, if there was a great and marvelous revival, that God began to move, and despite the leadership that we had in this country, God began to do great and wonderful and mighty things. And the only reference to Uzziah was to say this, in a dark, dark day, God began to move. Amen. And that's Amen. exactly what the the part about Uzziah in his, in his term, his realm ending was to give us a time set of when this happened. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Isaiah, the first, uh, the first five chapters are pretty hummy drummy. Listen, they're not about the goodness of God. They're not about God sitting on the throne doing what seemeth good unto himself. It's not about the provision of God when water runs from a rock. It's kind of dull stuff. But you know what happened next? Then he saw God. You know what will get you out of the hummy drummies quicker than anything get to to God? And, and, and listen, it'll change your mood. It'll change your attitude. It will change uh, your thinking about things. And, and so I want you to see, apparently, either this was a salvation experience. I don't think so. Uh, I, 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 I've always struggled. Was this the saving? 
warning of Isaiah or was it just a good wake up call for Isaiah? I'm not sure. But you know what? I do know this. Every once in a while, this old boy needs a good wake up. Yeah. Uh, let everybody be done with your life. Listen, you're 52 years old. The, boy, the better part of it's behind you. What have you really done to an account of anything under Christ? See, Isaiah needed to wake up. He needed to get. Uh, he needed his attention to be caught and to do something for the Lord God Almighty. And, and so uh, many times, many times. Well, I say always, and I very seldomly say always. Always, if a man wants to be uh, used of God, you've got to get a glimpse of the King. Amen. And if you're ever going to be used by God in the ministry at all, you've got to know who you're preaching about. And still, even then, sometimes it gets dull. And you got you got to see him again. I'm not talking about saved again. I mean see him again. And, and so we find then, in the year the king Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Now that is the position of God, the great God Jehovah, the God of all things. Listen, he's high and lifted up always. Listen, he's not the kind of God that's wondering what Biden's going to do. Amen. He's not the type of God that's wondering who, who, where the economy's going to go. Even this day, as I speak these words, he's high Amen. and lifted up and doing whatever seemeth good unto himself. That's the God of the Bible. It's not the God people want to embrace, but that is the God of the Bible. So watch your hummy drummies in these last day, in the days in which we live because they'll get the best of you, and that's what Satan wants. Now notice this. Uh, I saw him upon the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the, filled the temple. Now, I don't know, was Isaiah in the temple? I don't know. What, was he talking about the temple there in Jerusalem? I'm not sure. Uh, I think maybe he was, but then the, the just the por portion preceding that, uh, it said that he saw him high on the throne. There was no throne in the temple. So I, I, I'm not sure what he was seeing. But you know what? What we need today is the modern church. We need the train to fill the temple. We need the presence of the Almighty to be all-consuming. Listen, it don't matter if you just got three or four going. If the train fills the temple, boy, that's all you need. You know, what we measure success by and what God measures success by, success by in the ministry is two totally different things. You know what? If you measure it by what most Baptist preachers measure, measure today, you'd say Christ was a failure. He came out with... <laughs> Twelve men, and one of them was a devil. Yeah. After it's all over, there wasn't about 127 of them. So you're gonna you gonna measure that way? I don't think so. I want to measure by is the train in the temple or is it not? Is it a people that is filled and with, and with the interest of God or is it not? Well, what 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 does it possess? And, and so, as Isaiah has this experience, and he sees the, the, the presence of God, he began to do things for himself. Now, above, above it, and I, I don't know, I'm assuming the train, because that's the last subject that's uh, mentioned, above it stood the seraphims. Now, my understanding of the seraphims and the cherubims are called two different things, and they may be two different angels, but say this was the Ark of the Covenant, and, 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 and they would be facing each other like this, and their wings would come up over and touch the other one that was coming this way. And, and, and I don't know, is he talking about those? I don't know. But I do know whatever it was, it all of a sudden became living. Because <laughs> those were gold, if I understand the construction of the wilderness temple like I think I do. And they became something different. You know what? If you're really safe, you'll become something different. <laughs> And if, you, if you're not a living thing in the person of Christ, listen, make a calling and election sure. Because when you become living in Christ, there's always a difference. There's always something, uh, yeah, there's always something wonderful about being in the presence of God. So whoever, whatever these things were, the seraphims, uh, the two of them there, and it does say twain, uh, 
It said that they had six wings, not like the Catholic uh, supposed angel that you see with two pretty wings. These things had two up here, two right here, two down there, and they all had a purpose to do, and they all accomplished their purpose, and they were praising the Lord. Now notice what happens next. And one cried unto the other, Holy! Now, Holy! What are you supposed to do about it? Holy. That's it. And just keep going and going. Holy! 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 You know, when you get in the presence of the Almighty, that's the kind of stuff you do. Yeah. You know what's identified today? Uh, sad us, shame on us, Pentecostalism. But it is a holy, holy thing to be in the presence of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I dare say this. Most of them uh, don't know what I'm talking about because they never experienced it. But when you come into the presence of God, it is a holy thing. It's something that will change your life. It, it will make you something that you weren't before. And so this, uh, uh, this experience there, he was in the temple. He saw that the Lord required holiness. You know what the Lord still requires today? Holiness. Yeah. Uh, and listen, holiness is not a denomination. Holiness is a way of life. Amen. It, it's how you present to others. It, it, it's what drives you. And, and so we'll see that these angels, unlike us, uh, they don't have a choice but to say holy. That's their, it's just like if I play my phone and I pick out a song by the McCainies, you know who's going to sing? The McCainies, because I punched that one. They, they're not... They're not a being that can make choices. We are. That's what makes our praise different. Now, I understand that we're certainly elected of God. But listen, the Bible also says this. Some brought forth 30, some brought forth 60, and some brought forth 100. Mm -hmm. So are you going to praise or not praise? You know, I bet the angels would dearly love to, to have that kind of praise within them. And so we find these angels begin to praise the Lord and what it made Isaiah realize, hey, things are not good with me. You know what? When you get beside someone that has, that has a special kind of holiness, that has a special kind of uh, love for the Lord Jesus Christ, when a saved person gets around them and not being haughty and jealous about it, they want to be like them. He was very impressed by these angels and their desire to praise God. And he took a real long look at self. Mm -hmm. So you get around the right kind of people, you'll begin to take a real long look at self. Mm -hmm. and, and see exactly where you're at. And uh, uh, poor old Isaiah, just like me, he, he came up a few sticks short. And, and, and he knew it and he acknowledged it. Verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him, meaning the Almighty, and they cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, had all that occurred, most of us have been running out. The post, you think about this old building, uh, we, we don't have posts in the outside, we have two by fours. But in that day, all the buildings had huge posts, especially the tabernacle, because it was a tent. And then things began to shake and move, you know, and then all of a sudden the building was filled, the building was filled with smoke, and most of us would have ran out of there. But see, Isaiah had seen just enough that he knew he wanted more. Now, good sound Bible teaching will make you run to it or it'll make you run away from it. One of the two. And Isaiah got enough that he wanted to stay. He wanted to hear what the rest of this was about. Then said I, woe is me. Mm -hmm. Now, that woe is a, a term that describes illness or sickness. Woe. Woe is me. Now, uh, also can describe intense sadness. Woe is me. You know what the American people's problem is, and that may be why the Lord sticks in things. We're so self prideful. Uh, we don't think there's a woe in us, do we? Well, if you want that belly gets empty, you'll be woeing. 
right? Uh, Isaiah saw him sight in the light of the Almighty, and he knew that he wasn't right. He knew he, he knew he was in such a mess that he began to cry out, Whoa, listen, I'm grieving over myself. I, 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 I'm, I'm disturbed about what I see. I, I'm grieved with what's before me. Woe is me. Now, notice his self-assessment. You know, uh, do you ever do self-assessments? You know, me and Donna, and it been that way for a lot of years. Uh, I don't know, probably about four years ago, uh, the ups man was just struggling up them eight steps in front of our house, pulling something. I said, man, what has she ordered now? And he started laughing at me, and he said, with your wife, I don't know. And and, and so, I, I mean, I couldn't move it, so I cut it over trying, and it's a big old, Doctor scales. We have a, a doctor scale in our bathroom. And every morning, me and Donna get up, and I'm usually up a little bit before her, and we weigh. And she comes in, and I mean, just, I'll be honest, we're just obsessed with our weight because we're old. <laughs> and um, we uh, listen to the scales because the scale is right. Yep. It's the benchmark. Mm. Now I could say I can look at what it says and say, man, I'm down to 130. <laughs> but it wouldn't make it true. Right. I have I have to measure myself with that scale because it's the standard. And see, Isaiah got up to the scale and he knew he was lame. Yeah. He knew it was an issue with him. He knew there was a problem within him. Now, the difference between Isaiah and most of us, Isaiah was willing to do something about it. And, and in the modern day, I see very, very few believers that are really, you know, they, they might see the issue, they might hear the issue and preach them, but addressing the issue is a far another thing. And, and, and that's where we've come to in the modern day is addressing the problem. So he begins to see some things specifically. Woe is me, I'm in a mess, and for I am undone. Now, I don't know exactly this undone, we actually could run it a couple of different ways, actually. Now, Donna was stressed about her donuts this morning, and she told me how they weren't going to work out, nobody would eat them, blah, 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 and all this stuff. She didn't think they'd get done in the middle. And I don't know why she says too dense or something. I, I, I bread's not my thing. Uh, but uh, she did more than one donut in the middle. And so he was either... And this is what I think. I don't think he was finished yet. You know when I hope to give up the ministry, when y'all put me over there. That, that's when I'll be done. See, Uzziah, excuse me, Isaiah wanted to quit. He wanted to be done. He was sick of sinful Israel. He was sick of telling them and preaching and no response, no interest, no repentance, nothing. Year after year after year, I'm undone. I, 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 and then he realized, hey, you still got something to do. Now, the other thing is, is spiritual sickness. That word can also mean that you're sick. But I think that really thing at the end is pretty much the same thing, is it not? Remember this. Say, folks, Say folks can have spiritual sickness. You can develop apathy. You can develop unconcern. You can develop disinterest. You can develop, uh, you know what, <laughs> and swing the other way with the primitives and say, hey, whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved. Fully on it. You know what? You're undone. you got an issue. You've got a problem. When you get to the point that you don't have compassion for lost souls, you have a big, big issue. And so Isaiah, this man of God, this preacher of God, apparently uh, began to see himself in the light of the Almighty and His holiness. And he says, listen, I, I'm undone. I, I'm not where I need to be. Notice this, because I am a man of now, the biggest trouble you ever have, you three preacher boys who listen to me, is your big mouth. 
That, that's going to be your biggest problem in the ministry is the very device that you use for the ministry is also going to be the very biggest problem that you have in your ministry. Because listen, this is a, this is a devil that can barely be leashed. <clears throat> you watch what you say. And listen, if you say it, you better mean it. And I'll go even a little further. And if you say it and mean it, you better be able to back it up with that. Amen. And if you can't, you know what? The best thing is to keep your big mouth shut. Right? And, and, and so we find then that Isaiah makes this self-assessment in the light of the person of God. And he sees himself that he's in a mask. He said, I have unclean lips. I'm not saying the right things. I'm saying foul things. Then he says, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You know where we dwell today? The very same place. I tell him, Brother Jarrett, uh, we had this man who did an internship at the nursing home where I worked. And he had two boys. And they little bitty things. The oldest one was three. The little one was probably 18 months old. And I thought the oldest one was a girl. I was dressed in pretty little dresses and stuff. It was a boy. And um, we had a secretary, not the one we have now. We had a secretary. She's African American lady, very sweet. And she goes, You know that's a boy. And I and, and addressed it with it. But that's the day which we live, is it not? It, it's unclean. What, what, what's supposed to be very obvious, we live in an unclean day. Listen, you know why I knew I was a boy? It's because I was told I was a boy and I acted like a boy. And listen, a, a, a baby don't make decisions for itself. And so we, as the Lord's people, we live in a very, very unclean day when we have mamas and daddies encouraging people in such filth. Mm -hmm. It's an unclean day. It's an unclean time to live. We, we've arrived at the time that the prophets spoke of when they would call what's good bad and what is bad good. We're there. We're, we, 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 we've arrived. But does that give us a reason to stop? In fact, if I understand this text right, even Isaiah fired up. <laughs> It, it, it got him ready to go. It, it got him interested more than he'd ever been in his own ministry and what he had to do. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean, uh, in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to see the only time that you can see yourself as you as you really are is in the light of this book. Now, when you stand before the Almighty one day, the only thing that's going to be good about you is the merit of Christ. Amen. And uh, but you know what? I bet we get a, get a better glimpse of ourselves than we've ever had before. Yeah. And you know what? I'll be, I believe we'll be repugnant by it. Yeah. I believe I believe we'll be disgusted by ourselves. Because then we'll have a glimpse of ourselves as, as God would see us. In the light of who he is, in the light of his pureness and his grace. And we're not going to be excited about it. And, and so we see in the light of that, Isaiah gives a, gets a good look at himself. Now, the, the next statement is what I'm saying. Is the reason I say, I don't know if this is when Isaiah was saved, or maybe he just needed to get, get, get a line with what God's plan was for his life. But the angel runs and gets a hot coal and rams it in his mouth. And, you know, uh, two things that could be on it. Number one, fire is a purifier. Yeah. Now, on my surgery rotation, I've told you before, I hated every minute of my surgery rotation. Although it maybe it's decided for sure that's not what I didn't want to do as a nurse. But a lot of people don't know it. The next time you have surgery, you think about what, this, what they're going to do to you. <laughs> um, they heat the surgical scalpel and they cut it down like this. And it cauterizes it's on the way down. Right. And the smoke comes up. Most foul smell you'll ever smell in your life. And uh, he got that in the mouth. <laughs> but you know why we do that? Number one is to cauterize. And the second thing is because it's clean. You, you don't take bacteria down to the surgical site that way. 
It's clean because fire is a purifier. And, and, and so we find that as, as Isaiah is experiencing this event, that, that he realizes something about himself, and I don't know if it was lacking again. And, and some of you preacher boys can maybe clear me up on this, but I'm not sure exactly in verse 6 what's going on. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this had touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. Sounds like salvation to me. I've said, I don't know, but man, uh, this, uh, verse 7 excites me. <laughs> he got purged. You, you know what we need today is good purging. Get the draw fall. Get it out of the way. Make room for real fruits of the Spirit. Verse 8. Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who shall go for us? I love that word, us. Yeah. Then said I, Here I am, send me. <laughs> you see, that's another hallmark of a saved person right. is willingness. You know, you know what the hallmark of a either a lost person or someone that's way out of the will of the Lord is resistance. Right. I ain't going to do it. That's what we say here in the South, right? Well, you keep on that way, and if you're his, I, I just talked to Jonah about it. <laughs> he, he, he'll let you know uh, how the other street runs. And so we find then that, that now suddenly... Uh, Isaiah has a missionary's heart. Suddenly he's ready to go. Suddenly he has a burden of a people that he once hated. And he says, I'm ready. I'm going to do this. Just send me. Uh, authorize me. Make me go. And I'll get the job done. And he said, go and tell this people. You know what? Uh, young preacher boys is always uh, uh, dreaming about going to, to some faraway place on some obscure island. You know what Isaiah's ministry was to his very own people, the, the, the Jews. That was what his ministry was about. And you know what? When he got to see it was God's plan, he did it right. He wasn't critical of his own people anymore. He preached to them with compassion. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a huge, huge hallmark of someone that loves the gospel is when they preach it with love, not with hate. When, when they're willing to go on the street or go on knock on people's houses' door. Because listen, this is our time for worship, is it not? I mean, uh, majority of the people are claiming to be saved here. It's not time to beg people to the altar. What it is is a time for us who are saved to be rejuvenated and be gassed up for another week. That's what weekly services are about. But we see that Isaiah is going out to his very own people and preaching the very same thing he'd always preached. But now he was ready to do it. He was ready to do exactly what the Lord had told him. Notice God's plan. <laughs> and he said, go and tell this people, hear you indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Now this was God's plan for Isaiah's ministry. You're going to be a failure. They're not going to listen. They're not going to hear. They're not coming back to Jehovah. It's going to be a failure, but you make them accountable while you're doing it. Yeah. You like to hear that? You know, uh, Jared, when we were ordaining you, if I put that and put my hands on you, now, Jared, you're going to be a failure, but I'm going to be praying for you. <laughs> Man, that, that, that's not a shot in the arm, is it? Uh, <clears throat> Do you know what I say? I picked it up and just glad. Yeah, I yeah. know. Very faithful to it to the very end. Whatever your ministry is, pick it up and be glad. Mm. Use it. To the hundredth percent of yourself, 
pour out the, yourself to the end and keep going. And, and so we find that Isaiah uh, has a total change of heart and now he knows of a certainty he's going to be failure and he's excited about being a failure. <laughs> that, 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 that is always amazing. And verse 11, Then said I, Lord, how, should, how long? <laughs> how long am I going to have to be a failure? Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted. That's the attack uh, of the other kingdom. Be wasted without inhabitant, the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, for there'll be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tent, and it shall return, predicting of the recreation, if you will, the restoration of Israel. And But I want you to see, he says, how long I to keep it up? And the Lord says, till it's over, till it's done. <laughs> see, uh, after that not so happy, <laughs> nobody's going to listen to you. Then he says, well, how long have I got to do this? Nobody's going to listen to me uh, till it's done. You know how long you might be meeting with a handful of people till it's done. That's okay, is it not? Right. If God places you somewhere, what could be better? Yeah. That's the very best place for you, is it not? And, and so we find that, that Isaiah was satisfied, and if he followed it, he was drug off with the rest of them to Babylon, or maybe died just prior to that trip, and his entire ministry was to warn a people that would not hear. Listen, you know what? Uh, uh, and things have changed in my 26 years of ministry, but listen, I believe people are more dull of hearing now than they were in the mid-90s. And I'm sure Brother Junior said they're more dull of hearing now than they were in the 70s. And you you know what? It's going to be worse, but that don't get us off the hook, brethren. Uh, we are to still tell people of the goodness of God, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and how he died for his own. We're still to do it. Not a getting off spot. And so we understand that Isaiah did this very thing until he died. Now, go with me to Acts, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Acts 9, verse 20. The Bible says, And straightway he preached Christ, meaning Paul who would become the apostle out of time, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he, meaning Christ, that he is the Son of God. And they that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them that called on, on this name in Jerusalem and came thither for that intent, that he might bring them bound into the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength. Now listen, the more you stand for truth, the matter you're going to make people. Now as long as you're patting people on the back and everybody's equal and let's have a group hug, listen, you're going to be fine. But when you say, listen, men, married men, it's against the Bible. Children coming up and overpowering their parents is against the Bible us supporting things that the Bible clearly says ought not to be. You begin preaching and you get there at the home where men are dressed like men and women are dressed like women. And, and we are men who are responsible for our houses and we got to take that responsibility seriously. You keep preaching on those things and you know what? You're not going to be going, woo! -hoo! You're not going to have people cart with it. You, you know what I'm saying? You, you're going to get some of those looks like, I wish he'd shut up. Right? And that's kind of where Paul got to here. They were excited at first. Um, they were interested at first. The Jews got a hold of it and was a little upset about it. Now notice what they did. And after 
uh, excuse, verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, meaning he was able to project the gospel with their own words, proving that this is the very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Now, if they can't shut you up one way, they'll shut you up another. Now, we, we're in the day now, boys, we're down to the, the, the uh, eyeball to eyeball. Listen, uh, Biden's done promise to shut us down again. And you think, you know, you think it's just going to be the public school system. You better take a long another thought. He's got his eyeball on little restaurants like the Dover Cafe. He's going to shut them down. And you know what? His eyeball is set right here, too. Yeah. And you know what? We're still meeting. Yeah. And I'm not wearing a mask. And they can come and get me and call me off. And that'll be okay too. But you know what? We we need to stand for something, do we not? The Bible's very clear. If we're saying we need to see one of ourselves together. So is the government going to tell us it's not allowed? You know, is that not what part of the rebellion in 1775 was about? Doing what you thought was best, Right? Man, man doing the very thing that, that, that God directs him in. And so we find that Paul was not well thought of. And they said, okay, we'll take him out of the way. That's what happened. Verse 24. But their laying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night, and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he swayed to join himself to disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Now, I want you to see, and set the scene, I'm assuming that was at Damascus still. They, Paul became a great preacher. People listened to him. People were interested. He could confound the Jews because he listened. He knew what the Jews believed because he was a Jew himself. And... <laughs> They decided to kill him. So why didn't it happen? You're like, well, he escaped. No, no. God wasn't done with him yet. Right. He, he, he wasn't finished, or you know what? They would have killed him. See, God had, uh, you look through all the Bible, and God always works by means. Now, it may, you know, your means of death may be heart trouble. Your means of death may be cancer. I don't know. But, when it's your time to die, listen, you're on your way out. And I don't care if you have a team of surgeons around you, you're going to die. So number one, it wasn't the will of God. Number two, he wasn't finished yet. He was not done. He was undone. <laughs> he still had at least <laughs> 13 books of the Bible to write. And he had to preach the gospel at Rome. See, he wasn't done. We, we never need to get to the point that we think we're done. I'm old now, you know, I, I've done this for years, and now I'm going to just kick back and do what I want to. Listen, you know what? You, you'll never be of any service whatsoever in Christ when you pick up that attitude. You won't. Oh, I'm too young. I need to sit under an elder for a while. And I understand that to a point, and you do need to be taught before you run out and run out your mouth on your own. But don't use your youth as an excuse. And if you read about young Timothy, I think that you'll understand that, listen, that's not an excuse. Are you going to be criticized properly? And the Bible says when he's talking about Timothy, answer him with the scriptures. If they say you're too young, answer him with the word of God. Study to show thyself approved. And, and if you do that, all will be well. And, and so we find then that at the very point that the, the Jews thought that they were going to be done with him, God makes way because God was not done yet. He, he was not finished. Now look at me in Acts chapter 23, another time that Paul had been arrested. Uh, Acts chapter 23 and verse 10 and they're out in the courtyard, and there became an issue, and they was afraid that uh, Paul was going to get pulled apart, literally. 
And when there arose a great dissension or division, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him to the castle, give him a very safe place, they literally delivered him at the hands of Roman soldiers from the certainty of death to a special place in the castle. Who could do that but our God? Who, who could make you from a, a, a certain peril at one moment and living in the castle at the next? No one but God. And you know why he didn't get pulled in two pieces? God wasn't done with him yet. Yep. He just wasn't done with him. And, and that's exactly as Lord's people that we we need to aspire. And so he gets pulled up, he gets thrown up in the castle, and the night followed. Now, if I understand how the Jews counted their days, it was midday, and it says the night followed. Not that night, but the next night. You ever spent some dry days with the Lord Jesus Christ? Boy, I have. Or dry days by myself. Maybe that'd be a better way to put it. Just no answer at all. No presence of the Holy Spirit. Just wondering, how did I end up here? So he, he Paul had times like that, did he not? I think this is well documentation. But you know what? He didn't give, him, give up, did he? He didn't throw himself out of the castle window and say, well, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to kill myself. But he waited patiently on the Lord. The most difficult thing of the modern day man is patience because we have everything right here in an instant. Right? And now the only difference is this. God doesn't work this way. Wait on the Lord and give good courage. Amen? Yeah. And, and so we see that Paul, on the night following, the next night, he hears from Christ. Verse 11, he said, and, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for I have t thou hast testified me in Jerusalem, so thou must also must so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And so he was going to go to Rome with his preaching. And he didn't want to play this my my favorite part uh, about this uh, verse. It says that the Lord stood by him. I'm here, Paul. It's going it's going to be all right. Uh, but you got one more preaching job to do. And you're going to Rome to preach the gospel. And you know what? You better be very, very glad God. That's part of God's plan because ultimately that's how we got the gospel too. Uh, it moved into Europe after that. And we want to give great, wonderful praise. And in the last place, flip over and I'm not going to read it. Uh, it's Timothy. He says Timothy in chapter 4. For I'm now ready to be offered. Amen. And the time of my departure is at hand. Amen. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Big difference in the writing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know what? There'll be a time when it comes, but don't act like it's tomorrow. Right. There'll be a time when your ministry is done, and, and, and that's you members and ladies. Uh, th there's a ministry that you have. There's a ministry you, that you possess, and hopefully you use it to the best of your, of, of your ability. And, but yet yeah, still one day it'll be over. But in the meantime, keep going. In the meantime, be zealous. You know what? I believe Isaiah was a very zealous man for the Lord. He looked at people right in the face, their stony, hard faces that was full of blindness and fatness and never responded once. And he preached the goodness of their God. Repent, repent. And never had a response. And you know what? The next day he'd get up and he'd find somebody else with those cold, glassy eyes and he would do the very same thing all over again. Until finally they were swept away by that one. See, we just need to keep going, don't we? Just keep it preaching it line upon line, precept upon precept. Keep preaching it, keep preaching it, keep preaching it. The Lord take care of all the rest. Yeah. He really will. So, this morning, where, where are you at in that? 
If you stood face to face with the Almighty like no doubt Isaiah did, how are you going to feel? <clears throat> What's going to be your response? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to claim the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But, until then, I want to do the, the very, the, what he called me to do is preach the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. Also, what he's called you men to do is provide for your family. That, that, that's not something that you can unhook yourself from if you've got family. It, in fact, you know, and I've been preaching for some 27 years. If I quit providing to them, say, Donnie, you take care of it, I believe my ministry is shot in a moment. The Bible says this, he that provideth not for him, except for his family is worse. Worse off than an infidel. And that, that's someone who believes nothing. So what are you going to do until the Lord returns? Not until Biden is inaugurated this week, but what are you going to do until the Lord returns? Because see, I, I'm looking beyond that. I'm thinking about September and the fall. We had that meeting. We will see people we hadn't seen in a long time, and, and we're going to be able to be encouraged by them. I'm thinking about going to South America, and they, they're crazy down there about COVID. I mean, COVID crazy. But you know what? I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. That's where we need to be. Exactly where, we, where God would have us to be. Is that where you're at? Are you going to be demurred by the world? By what they have to say about their opinion of God? Or are you going to, are you going to continue on? That's the real question, is it not? That's where we need to be. Brother